Kia ora, Governor. Thank you for joining us. Rates cut last week to be cut again in February. How much more do we think rates will be cut? Yeah, um, uh, kia ora and great to be here talking with you. Uh, yes, you're right, we've taken uh, the official cash rate down to four and a quarter percent. Uh, we've signalled another half a percent, another 50 basis points in February. That's always conditional, subject to the economy panning out broadly as we see it. Um, and then beyond that, um, we're saying somewhere towards a neutral interest rate, which is around 3%. Um, and that's towards uh, end of next year going into 2026. Um, so uh, great to be in this position to be able to ease monetary policy. Quick history lesson, 2020, COVID hits, you probably remember. The Reserve Bank embarks on a path of least regrets, you called it at the yeah. time. Large scale asset program, commonly known as money printing. With the benefit of hindsight, any regrets? Uh, no, um, I think the, um, the NOMA money printing is wrong. We were buying government bonds, uh, we were selling into the second, um, buying them from the secondary market, so we weren't physically printing money. We were um, taking other people's assets and swapping them for cash, so taking long dated assets and creating cash, creating liquidity. Cash flow and confidence was, was, was the name of the game. Uh, we had to take a least regrets because um, the alternative was horrendous, you know, one of, um, of deflation, significant depression, um, considerable job loss um, and chaos. Also a big part of that program was providing liquidity to um, the financial markets and to businesses to enable you know, the wheels of business to keep, to keep turning basically. People love to talk about um, the current costs, but what they don't see is the alternative, the opportunity costs of what did we head off. The IMF did some great work recently and they said, thumbs up, um, you know, we have created a, a very stable environment uh, and one where the um, current costs are more than overwhelmed by the net benefits that that activity brought. But during that time, uh, the Reserve Bank was repeatedly warned that it could push up house prices and deepen inequality. Wasn't that exactly what happened? Uh, well, what happened was that uh, we saved the economy from deep recession, uh, businesses stayed in, in, in action, the financial system remained resilient and robust, and we came out the other side of it um, with inflation at 7% well below most of our global partners and in a position where we have been able to take that inflation out. What people went and did with that money um, uh, is a disappointment. You know, too many people just saw that as an opportunity to punt or stag the property market. Other people used the cash flow to, um, to stay in business or stay afloat as human beings. You know, this, this uh, infatuation with the housing market is um, just too much driven by the media. You blame the media for that, or people, you know, New Zealand seems to have an obsession with house prices. We, we have an and responding to obsession. that, a, a, an obsession with the OCR and interest rates, right? I, I can't open a newspaper or uh, that's those old things with paper um, or go online or, or see TV news without some reference to house prices. As soon as we started talking about reducing the official cash rate, house prices came back in. Uh, I understand it, I don't blame the media, um, it's the structure of the New Zealand economy. You know, um, well over two thirds of household wealth is equity, equity in a home. And we, too, we see it far too much as a means of investment rather than just a place to live. Um, so we have one of the most um, expensive housing markets in the OECD. Do you agree then that that obsession with housing has turned into an obsession with the OCR and interest rates? And do you feel some responsibility then for the way people react and how it affects them? Uh, no, I feel responsible for low and stable inflation as one of the tasks of the central bank. We do nothing other than try and target consumer price inflation to remain with between 1 and 3 per cent per annum. Our main instrument is the official cash rate. There's a long lag between what we do and how the inflation eventually unfolds. So that's our task. We don't, we don't target house prices. We, we, we will talk about um, asset values because that's part of the consumption basket, uh, you know, driving spending. But we target inflation. Uh, um, so, you know, that's, um, that's it is. I'd, I'd be thinking more about uh, why aren't people investing in things other than just housing all of the time? What, what is this underlying structure? Uh, we, we've been putting out health warnings for decades around the, um, the value of housing relative to anything we can see as sustainable. 
On inflation, are we too far behind the trends? In 2021, it became clear inflation was rising globally. You didn't lift the rates here until October 2021. Was that too late? Uh, we were one of the first, probably the second or third central bank in the world to raise interest rates. Uh, we would have done, gone a little bit earlier, but Auckland went back into lockdown. In fact, the, the day before we were about to reduce interest rates, Auckland went back into lockdown. So we have been known as one of the people who moved uh, the fastest around it on least regrets, and we are certainly lauded internationally, obviously not domestically, internationally has been one of the most responsive central banks to raising interest rates. We've also uh, raised rates where we are now um, one of the few central banks who are confidently reducing it now that inflation is back at the midpoint, inflation expectations are anchored again, and core inflation is coming back. So, you know, you, that, um, your potted history is, is uh, kind of incorrect. Well, I looked back on that August 2021 monetary policy statement, and yes, we did go into lockdown, which changed everything. I think that made it clear in that oh, statement. Just delayed things but it also it also talked about the fact that you expected inflation to be back within the, that midpoint range by mid 2022. It's taken two years longer can, than that can, to um, get there. Uh, with your history, can you think what then happened next? Further lockdowns. Uh, further lockdowns. A war in the Ukraine, which was saw energy and food prices. Um, you know, our, our colleagues uh, in Europe were experiencing inflations north of 20% per annum through to the UK, 15%. Global inflation, you know, it wasn't just the one shock. We've had rolling shocks since, since the time you've brought them. Uh, we've had a, a, a pandemic, we've had wars and we've had cyclones. You know, we're, we're just obviously waiting for the locusts or something next. These are rolling shocks. So globally, Everyone had to roll with those shocks. We've done work, uh, we've done our own uh, review, we then had an internationally peer reviewed, it's then since been used in the COVID-19 report. Our finding is what could have we done better? Yes, we could have raised interest rates a little bit earlier, but if we wanted to retain um, with the full benefit of information, if we had wanted to retain inflation between um, you know, one and three percent interest rates would have had to go up over seven percent on the uh, on the the day of the pandemic announcement, uh, and we still would have ended up with six percent annual inflation because of the other shocks. So, you know, a full picture would be would be wonderful. Um, I think history will reflect a little bit kinder than than that potted dialogue. Flipping that around, then. Have you also been too slow to drop rates? And, and I guess, do you accept any misjudgments under your watch? Uh, look, you know, this is an approximate business. Between shifting the official cash rate and actual consumer price inflation being um, at its peak impact is about an 18-month period. That is subject to nothing else happening in between around with rolling shocks. We are one of the few central banks now, 2.2% headline inflation. Uh, core inflation at three and, and, and trending towards the middle. Uh, inflation expectations across all horizons well anchored. So we are now in a comfortable position to be talking about our forward movements subject to no other shocks. So, you know, the worst mistake we could have made was to have done all the hard work to get on top of inflation and then let it go again. Um, and when inflation expectations are starting to rise, that's when you see a very nervous central bank. In November 2022, you told the Finance Select Committee that the Reserve Bank was deliberately engineering a recession. Was that the right decision? Uh, so what we were doing, you know, we were saying, well, is it a recession, is it a recession? And I said, yes. What we were doing is deliberately engineering a slowdown in domestic demand. Um, the challenge for this country is that if, if the average growth rate is 2% per annum, then a slowdown in demand that's sufficient to take the heat out of it is going to be close to zero growth rate. And that's what we've experienced through time. We've been bouncing around about a flat level of economic growth, uh, the level for the last 18 months. That has been deliberate um, in terms of slowing the domestic demand, but we don't have any say over what pace the, the economy can run on average. So we just need to slow it you know, relative to the supply capacity of the economy. So deliberate, yes, because we had, we had excess demand, high inflation, and we need to have excess supply and reduce inflation. That's our job. That deliberate recession then has caused 
thousands of people to lose their jobs. Not a soft landing you wanted, right? A hard landing. Uh, I don't know the definition of soft or hard. I'll be looking forward to that. I see some people talk about us as, as being a soft landing. Unemployment uh, is bad. Inflation creates unemployment. It doesn't um, create employment. So first and foremost, the best thing we can do is keep low and stable inflation through time. Uh, those people who are going to be most impacted by um, uh, inflation are generally the most vulnerable parts of society. So, um, you know, keeping low and stable inflation is the only and most important part we can do. Yes, when you have shocks and inflation um, goes outside your target band, we have to slow demand. Um, it can come through in lower profits. It doesn't always have to come through in lower wages or more unemployment. That's really the dynamics of the economy. Inflation is falling, house prices are starting to go up, but unemployment is as, as well. Growth is nowhere to be seen really in your projections for the next year. Well, that's false. How, close, close to zero? No, no, close to potential. Close, what's potential for growth? Uh, well, we're talking around 2.5% economic growth over, over calendar 2025. And we're talking about growth having started as, as we sit here today. So, so um, you know, that is... That is um, uh, potential economic growth, it's nirvana. And Where are those areas of growth? Uh, we see them in the most interest rate sensitive parts of it. It'll be coming through in the construction type sectors, the manufacturing, services where where people have a more surplus income as, as the interest rates ease. All of these types of, um, almost exactly the same sectors that have done it hard recently when interest rates are higher, they can do it easier when interest rates are lower. So, you know, we're confident around the growth. Yes, unemployment, according to our projections, will continue to rise until about mid next year. Uh, why? Because the labour market lags the real business cycle. You know, when, when you start to slow down, people hang on to their labour force as best they can, then over time as business, you know, they try and hold their prices, they drop their prices, eventually people may be laid off. Well, it's the same thing that winds itself back the other way. It's a while before people have the confidence to re-employ again. Um, but um, given, given, you know, unemployment, we're talking about peaking at 5.2%. Um, that's, that's, you know, very sad. Um, at the same time, it's relatively low compared to historical um, uh, cyclical slowdowns and, um, and unemployment. It could be even lower if we were more productive or, or um, had better skills or more mobile, you know, other than that. Well, how slow is that recovery going to be? Businesses have been talking and hoping, I think, about survive till 25. Is it now more like wait till 26 for the fix? Oh, I think it's thrive in 25. You know, we, we are talking about 2.5% economic growth. Um, we're, we're past our darkest period. Um, we are now back into a period with, um, you know, the interest rate sensitive parts. You've seen confidence come back. You just mentioned about, you know, people sniffing the housing market, uh, construction activity. So as these, these relative lags work their way through, it, it's, it's more of a thrive. Uh, are we projecting, you know, a boom in economic growth? No. I mean, the economists don't do that. The best thing, you know, at, at best, we are good at predicting, predicting the, the general trend direction. The pace may surprise us, it may be much stronger. Um, pace may be a bit weaker. We, you know, that's how we'll have to see how it plays out. That's why we don't rush to cut interest rates immediately to neutral. Um. We're still seeing a large number of business failures though. That's not going to help grow growth and productivity. Ah, no, I agree. Um, so again, um, you know, the lags, it's a long lag between economic activity, you know, GDP growth, so, and what's happening in the, in the financial sector, particularly by the time you get to a non-performing loan or, or a business shutting down. You know, you've got that period of, of um, uh, changing prices, changing costs, to eventually saying, I'm out to the bank, working with you to the bank, then eventually saying, you're out, and then working through courts. These things can be up to five years. Um, so, you know, globally, as with the IMF just recently, that is their estimate across, across um, the OECD countries. It's about a five-year lag between the trough of economic activity and the peak of, of non-performing loans. Could the government be spending more money without it being inflationary to help support some of those businesses and prevent job losses? I think um, the, the most critical thing that governments internationally do um, and have to do is, you know, close this investment deficit. We have a global infrastructure deficit. New Zealand is at one of the most extreme parts of it. 
when you look at our at the structure of our economy, all of our capital is in the housing market. Very little of it is in the business side of activity. We have one of the what would be called one of the most capital shallow economies in the OECD. If we want to increase output, we just get more people. Um, we don't try and do the same thing better or do better things. Um, so we need capital investment. Core government, local government are the owners of a lot of that infrastructure, but are also the um, enablers and facilitators of allowing other infrastructure to be built. This is the global challenge. Um, how do you match that when governments around the world are talking about fiscal problems, lower debt, lower spending, when they're also talking about more investment needed in infrastructure? So um, New Zealand is no different. We're at one of the lower ends of, of um, public debt um, uh, relative in the OECD, um, very low relative to most OECD countries, but we have one of the largest infrastructure deficits. So thinking differently, you know, stop thinking about how can we do it the same. That's the definition of insanity, isn't it? Doing it the same over and over again, um, same outcome. Doing it differently. Should the government spend more then? Uh, I think the government needs to spend a lot more in infrastructure and investment and it needs to um, source capital and crowd in um, investment um, far more effectively than what has happened probably since post-World War II. So successive governments actually need to be spending more and more and less about that debt? Uh, I don't know about the debt because, um, you know, if you are investing, it doesn't mean that debt rises. It actually means that you are getting higher returns, you've got a higher tax base, you've got more revenue. So it doesn't always mean one for one. If you consume it um, and there's no payback to that consumption, then yes, that's a one to one. But if you're investing and creating more productive economy, a more inclusive economy, um, you know, more social cohesion, you have a virtuous circle rather than a vicious circle going on. And so batting our way back into a virtuous circle is, is critical. You know, we've got climate change challenges, we've got all the geopolitical tensions, we've got the trade challenges. Um, you know, if we sit and wait for what's an ideal time to invest intergenerationally, it's never going to be here. The last government kept spending money once the Reserve Bank had slammed the brakes on. In reverse, this government doesn't want to spend. The Reserve Bank is loosening monetary policy. How do you get monetary and fiscal policy to work together while yeah. still retaining the independence of the Reserve yeah, Bank? That's, that's a great question. I'll, I'll note this government also provided tax cuts, which are themselves stimulatory. So whilst it was cutting spending, it was also encouraging um, uh, more spending outside, so you know, net net about square, so far. But um, you know, the monetary uh, very quickly, central banks have been given the operational independence to get away from that three-year election cycle. You know, um, the Muldoon year he used to set interest rates driving in from the hut of a morning, based on where his popularity was, and that is not about how you control inflation. So that's why we have the immense responsibility of. Um, of low and stable inflation and, and to become unliked um, often in doing that. Uh, fiscal policy is something that every government wants to have their own flavour of and they're, they're you know, elected every three years. Um, we have a Fiscal Responsibility Act which tries to put some stability but um, you know, um, every elected official is going to want to have their particular flavour on, on spending. What can we do between uh, the Te Pūte Matua, the Reserve Bank and Treasury? We can stay as close as possible and, and, and share our insights, but, um, but we can't tell the government what they can or can't do with, with fiscal policy. That's their prerogative. We just have to play the cards that are dealt. And for both Treasury and Reserve Bank, the data you're working off is often backwards looking. And does that create a problem? Does that make it harder to, to forecast and to make decisions like those OCR decisions? And therefore, do we actually need to look at a way of speeding up inflation data, um, GDP data? Yeah, critically. I mean, uh, you know, the, the good news is we don't sit and wait for the GDP data or the size. So even if we did wait, it's going to be revised 12 months later again anyway. Constantly uh, revised. Exactly. Uh, we only have quarterly CPI data. Uh, you know, one area for investment that I would love to see is in our data from our, our official statistics. Isn't the government cutting many uh, of the, the data The official statistics have been at the short end of the stick for as long as I've been involved um, at the central bank. You know, it's so hard to explain to people the value of data. Now, the good news on the other side is that our reliance on official stats has declined as we have, you know, with technology. We, we have 
an unbelievable myriad of real-time sensors of what's going on in the economy from FPOS through to trucking activity through to uh, uh, bank credit data so on and so forth so we've got a you know a huge repository of real-time indicators uh, I always think you know just to explain to the public um, there's three main uncertainties in, in predicting the first one is where are we currently and that is a really hard assessment. At the moment, we are quite confident we know where we are, which is why we're talking so confidently about, about cutting the official cash rate. The next uncertainty is how does the economy actually work? You know, the, the, the behaviour of economic activity changed fundamentally through the COVID period. We sat on the couch and gorged on services. When we came out of lockdown, we got off the couch and gorged on goods. And you know that's a global phenomenon, and so all of the data, the seasonality, the, the travel, the tourism, just collapsed. And so, you know, trying to assess is the economy still working as our frameworks and models tell us was very hard. The good answer is yes, um, but it took a while for us to get there. And then the third uncertainty is what's going to happen next. Um, you know, we've, we've got you know avian flu down south today. You know, it's you just never know where the next shock is coming from. Looking forward at the moment, uh, I've never seen more nervous central bankers around the world. Um, not about uh, we're all happy now. Inflation is coming back in, and we all patted each other on the back recently at the BIS. But um, relative prices, the prices of energy, the price of food, the price of imported goods is swinging violently and that's because of the climate change, the geopolitical tensions, the, the tariff trade barriers and so this relative price noise creates a lot of uncertainty and creates, creates uh, more volatility in overall inflation. So we're comfortable where we are but we provide a bit of a warning looking ahead Wow, it's looking pretty noisy out there. So even by February, you think it could have changed? Uh, we think that's too soon. You know, we're quite comfortable over the next few months. You know, and if there was something dramatic change, we'd be back at the table immediately. We're, you know, um, but you know, it's really more about towards the end of next year and onwards. Higher volatility in relative prices, higher variability in aggregate inflation, and generalised economic uncertainty globally as we try this this massive transition from free trade to mercantilism and this and this climate change shift. Really significant once in a generation challenges to society. Are banks here in New Zealand making excessive profits? Uh, we think they have been. You know it's um, relative to the risks they've taken on. Um, it's been a real challenge um, across that. Uh, you know you've got four and a half large banks, uh, four of them with cost to income ratios so significantly lower than other banks they can compete and, and win business it makes it very hard to, to climb in and compete against them uh, and so you know they have been relative to the risk taken on they have been extremely well rewarded here in New Zealand. The banks would argue that some of that burden is placed on them by the Reserve Bank due to regulation, uh, the capital they have I to hold, etc. You yeah. love that argument? Yeah, because it's just, it's just nonsense. You know, it's it's a rock to hide behind. You know, I've said often to the banks, if you know, if you've got someone leaning over the farm gate telling people that you'd love to lend to them and make make it cheaper, but you know, the Reserve Bank told me not. That's garbage. The uh, there are they would say the capital that you've, you've I totally understand the capital. argument, yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and it would add you know, so little to the total cost of their capital. The pricing structures, you know, um, uh, who are they borrowing the money from to on lend, is, uh, what do they have to pay for deposits to get it on board, who are they lending to, what are the risks, what are the costs of lending to them, um, all of those factors are the pricing factors. Capital is a small component of that but it's too often used um, as an excuse for the price. We set the capital based on risk. We don't set it on where they should be allocating their capital. It's the risk. So I'm very proud of our, of our capital and um, you know, we are more common internationally, not more rare. Your tenure is in one of the most, in one of the most powerful roles in the country, ends in 2028. You're gonna see out the full term? Uh, full intention, yeah. Looking, enjoying it still? Uh, well, you know, that's an emotion. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I absolutely enjoy it. The bits that we've been talked about are such a small part of the day job. You know, the day job is, is uh, operating with uh, an incredibly talented team for a full service central bank. 
payment and settlement systems, money and cash, uh, the prudential regulatory side of the banks, and the monetary policy. You know, I would really love the bank to be known for far more than the official cash rate. But, you know, I, I get why it is the OCR. But So we've got strong strategic themes now which, um, which are really motivating us, um, you know, around trust through our communications, uh, inclusion or participation, a lot of work around uh, uh, access to capital, uh, access to bank accounts, resilience with the climate change and the capital work, uh, technology and data around how can we do the same things better, innovation, central bank digital currencies, competition and efficiency. It's a very rich, um, rewarding environment. Big weight on your shoulders though. It is, yeah, yeah. The good news is uh, I'm not the only pair of shoulders in the bank. You know, we um, what we've been doing uh, since I've been here, which is the main reason why I came, was fundamentally modernising the bank. We now have a fully uh, empowered corporate type board. I'm a director. We now have a monetary policy committee rather than a single decision maker. I'm the chair of that. So I've got enormous support and we've got uh, an increased capacity capability across the whole leadership structure in banks. So, so it's been a privilege. We've got a lot more to do. We've got enormous challenges around cash, um, central bank digital currencies, the technology sides. Um, you know, there's not a single part of the bank that isn't being fundamentally challenged. Thank you for your time. Thank you.